Thanks for participating in iPollinate. I'm Alex harmon -Threet. I'm a professor at the Department of Entomology at the University of Illinois and one of the co-creators of iPollinate. Today I'm going to try and walk you through uh, some of the key components of collecting data at your own research garden. We're here at my house and this is my research garden. It's still, mid, it's still late May so the garden is not looking as beautiful as it should be by the time we're ready to collect data but we wanted to get this out to you as soon as possible. So when I was choosing my flowers, I wanted to choose plants that were different than the ones that I recorded data on last year, and ones that I found visibly appealing. Um, I'd never had these cleums before. I was pretty excited to find these in the um, at the store. And um, lantanas I haven't used before, so I was pretty excited uh, to, bring those back, uh, to bring those in. Um, alyssums I have used before, but those usually are pretty attractive, so I thought I'd give myself a little bit of an upper hand. This is my little garden. I'm not one much for using um, very many uh, chemicals or mulch or anything like that in my yard. So this is a little bit weedy um, and that's totally okay. Thank you for taking the time to observe pollinators in your research garden. You will be observing only on the annual plants and not on the milkweed. These plants were chosen because they are either very commonly purchased by gardeners or commonly recommended for pollinators, but little data exists on their performance across many conditions. Our goal is for you to record data on each plant species multiple times during each week. So with six plant species, we hope you will record at least three observations in each one. Much of the project should be able to be completed in about an hour a week. Before beginning, please review how to tell a bee from a fly or a wasp. All three of these can look very similar, but it is important to try to distinguish them. If you are unsure, you can enter the visit as other. Start by checking the weather, date, and time and recording those on your datasheet. You may also create your own datasheet on a piece of blank or notebook paper to allow you to record more observations. When you are ready to begin collecting data, find a comfortable seat and identify two plants that you can observe from this location. The two plants should be of the same variety. Set your timer for three minutes and watch for any insects that visit the flowers of the plants. Please do not count things on the leaves. If you see something move to multiple flowers on either of your two plants, please only count it once. However, if it moves away from your two plants and comes back, you may count it again. These are considered independent visits. Quite often, you will not see anything visit your plants during the few minutes you are there, and that's okay. This zero information is incredibly important to make sure we make good recommendations for which plants are most attractive to pollinators. If you have a large, beautiful, bee-friendly yard, you may be even more likely to see a few things visit your research garden. Remember to also take time to look carefully at your milkweed plants and check for the various instars if you are participating in that portion of the project. Thank you again for your time and we hope you enjoy participating in iPollinate. For more information, please visit our webpage iPollinate.illinois.edu. It has shown that the broader habitat context surrounding a garden matters to how attractive it is to pollinators. For example, a bee may be more likely to visit a plant if there is nothing else around. Because of this, it is normal for you to record how your garden is doing, what is happening in your yard, and what is happening around your yard in your neighborhood. Floral surveys should be conducted within a week of collecting data on visitors to your research garden. If you are sampling during the third week of the month, you will only have to do this once. If you are sampling multiple times a month, you may need to repeat it more than once a month. To start your yard assessment, first look at your research garden and evaluate its health on a scale of 1 to 5. Dr. Harmon's reeds were establishing well due to the early rains, but some had been munched on, so she gave it a 4. Please quickly document how far your research garden or planters are from other plants in your yard. Ideally, it is XX feet away from other plants, but if it had to be closer, we understand. Next, start walking around your yard and count how many flower varieties are blooming in the entire yard. If you have two types that are the same species but different colors, please count them separately. And if you have the same plant in multiple locations, please be careful to only count it once. It may be useful to write them down as you go. Make sure to take your time. This garden had 24 species blooming during this demonstration. Now take a quick assessment of the floral abundance within 100 yards of your property. Dr. Harmon Threet lives on the corner, so you can easily see in all four directions and the front yards of most of her neighbors. While some yards have a few flower types, most yards do not have large diverse gardens and so she selected low. 
Last, we would like you to share what plants in your yard outside of your research garden are most attractive to pollinators. This information provides some additional valuable information about other attractive varieties that we may be able to recommend in the future. Please do these surveys between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. If you have decided on the five or fewer attractive plants in your yard, please approximate the number of flowers. Note that if the same flower variety is in multiple places, count all of the blossoms together. To count these quickly and easily, we use the XXX method, which means you count dense clumps of flowers in an inflorescence, spike, head, or umbel as one flower. This number doesn't have to be super precise and round to the nearest number on the sheet. Thank you so much for watching, and please visit us at ipollinate.illinois.edu with questions. everyone and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions and we are excited to talk all about pollinators today and we have a special guest who will introduce herself here in a second. Uh, but we're going to kick us off. My name is Candace, uh, State Master Gardener Specialist for U of I Extension and I'm based here in Central Illinois and I love to chat about anything flower related. Annuals, perennials, cut flowers, those are my favorites. Um, gardening topics, but my fellow horticulturists like to chat about other things too. So Kelly, you want to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I am at home today, so I do not have my extravagant background, <laughs> but I did I did bring in a plant, uh, nice. my blue salvia. So I am Kelly Alsup, and I am a horticulture educator based out of Bloomington. My specialty within the state is integrated pest management. So I really know how to kill those insects. But um, I say that I spend more time trying to promote insects like pollinators and beneficial insects, such as today's program. And um, I'm very passionate about trees and I love growing my own vegetables and herbs. And so um, even though insects really are my um, expertise on the team, um, I'm, pat I'm an overall good horticulturist. Well, <laughs> you have to be, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> overall good at, know a little bit about everything. That's right, Ryan, Ryan, would you say that's you too? Yeah, that kind of defines our job as horticulture educator. We have to know a little bit about everything. Um, so I'm Ryan Pancaw, horticulture educator out of Champaign. Uh, my formal training and background really is in woody plants and shrubs. So that's kind of my area of expertise. But like Kelly, I'm a backyard vegetable gardener. I've been doing that for years. And I'm a native plant lover. So that's what's really got me into the whole pollinator relationship is just native plants. That's a real big focus of mine. Um, I do a lot of my gardening and landscaping with natives and all kinds of pollinator habitats. So with that, let's go to our special guest for today. Would you mind please introducing yourself to the crowd? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Harmon-Threed. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Entomology here at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Um, I study bees predominantly. I actually originally started studying plants, and so I am a much better botanist than I am entomologist. Do not tell my department chair. <laughs> uh, I've, managed, I've managed to get tenure with that. I'm knowing very little about insects that are bees. Um, and uh, so... I do. I grew up gardening with my mom. I really love gardening. The house that I live in right now actually doesn't have very much yard space. And I'm actually, uh, uh, fr last Friday, the city of Champaign knocked on my door and said, we're tearing up your entire front yard because we're putting in a new sidewalk. 
So oh, all of this place that I've been putting all of these lovely native plants and all of these, you know, pollinator friendly things and where my eye pollinate garden would normally go is going to cease to exist soon. So, uh, cause they're going to have yeah. to regrade the entirety of my front yard uh, to put this sidewalk in. So, you know, mm-hmm. A chance to know. start over. That's what I was just going to say. Yeah. A fresh start. <laughs> you know, I, there are there are some weedy plants that I've been battling for several years, and I was like, "Ha ha!" There the you back, go. The backhoe will get you. <laughs> <laughs> Dig out the good stuff and save that, and let the rest yeah. go. <laughs> so, uh, Alex, it's it's almost like you're kind of like us that you're an entomologist and you know a little bit about entomology, but you know a lot about bees. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, pollinator health, pollinator gardening has been a huge trend um, in the past, I mean, 10 years, 15 years, it's really been heating up. And, um, you know, we we hear the big names, uh, we hear about the bee spotter and we hear about May Berenbaum and the Sydney Cameron and the work that you're doing and the David Zaya. So, one of the things that you created was um, a program that can help pollinator health. But tell us, like, you know, what's the main issues with bees in Illinois? Uh, that's a great. Uh, thanks, Kelly, for that question. So uh, one of the big challenges for bees, not in people's backyard, is just that, you know, most of Illinois is basically covered with a monocrop, right? Corn, which corn soy is usually considered like a single uh, crop. And so that just means that there's very little habitat on the landscape for pollinators. Very, very, very little. Um, we know that uh, some of the worst estimates of estimates of loss of tall grass prairie habitat is that we're down to like less than 1%. And I know in Illinois, it's probably pretty close to that. There's just not a lot of habitat left. And um, a lot of the, the monocropping really um, accelerated that because previously people would have really small like gardens that were super diverse. They'd have, you know, fields where they had their cows and uh, just a small number of cows. They'd have lots of different vegetables. They'd have kind of edges that they didn't meticulously spray and mow. And all of that actually allowed a lot of insects to kind of persist in the habitat. And um, there was a uh, there's a researcher at Wisconsin that has really done some uh, looking back at the um, aerial photos of farms, right, from like going back to the early 1900s. And like it, you can see how it had like, oh, this farm was super diverse. It had like clearly like, you know, 50 different crops growing on it and all of these like kind of untilled, unmowed kind of like extra habitat areas. And then like there is a shift where all of a sudden it just becomes like a monocrop, a monocrop of corn soy. And that just really leaves very little habitat for uh, for native, all native insects, not just native pollinators. And that has really kind of precipitated a lot of declines, um, which has been really tough because we're not moving away from corn soy anytime soon. And so like, how do we get as much habitat back onto the landscape as we can, including habitat in people's yards, because there's been, Increasing evidence that like urban gardens are just like can be hot spots for uh, for people for uh, pollinator diversity. Well, so it's interesting how all those all those nooks and crannies, all those places in the ag landscape that used to be around the fence rows. Um, yeah, just you mentioned like the unmowed spots and things. I can remember some of these when I was a kid growing up in central Illinois that just are gone. So we I mean, we really are kind of losing even like those little shreds that yeah, really points towards the importance of our home landscapes and, and what kind of natives we can add there, what kind of habitat we can build. So, so you focused on the value of those planted spaces and how those can attract insects and things. So that's kind of the focus of your work, correct? Yeah, so uh, my, my, my broader research is all on uh, trying to figure out how we can better conserve pollinators by learning things about them in natural areas. And so that's what we do kind of all the time, right? We, uh, we have sites that we visit, we actually have a lot, the university was kind enough to give us a large plot of land that we do like replicated experiments, looking at how bees respond to different um, planting diversities, different soil treatments, um, and, you know, whether or not they're nesting in those habitats or visiting flowers in those habitats. 
but then, um, yeah, you know, I, I really love to garden and I love having a really diverse yard. I'm constantly, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly adding new plants, new things, looking at what's visiting what. And um, ultimately was really interested in trying to figure out way, like solutions for people in their homes, right? Like what can we get people to do at their houses? Because, you know, I'm not, uh, as much as much as I think I would like to believe that my research is contributing a lot to trying to help improve conservation, we also, you know, people are often asking me really things about their, about like, okay, I want to do something. What can I do at my house? Um, and uh, I really wanted to start doing a little bit of research on uh, um, how do we do that? What do we tell them to do at home uh, to make it a little bit better for pollinators? Because I feel like, you know, I think every little bit helps. Every, you know, every additional uh, plant that we put uh, 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 in our yards, every new native species, every new pollinating supporting annual or perennial, they all move the needle where things just do a little bit better. And um, my yard that I mentioned is going to get probably totally torn up. I love to watch my neighbors walk by and they just stop because they can, there's just so many insects just like swirling around my yard because, you know, I don't use any pesticides. I kind of just like, I just let it do whatever it wants mostly. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not a I'm not a very neat gardener. Um, no, I think that's what makes your science super interesting to me um, as you know a gardener, an entomologist yeah. is. We know a lot about monarchs. We know a lot about honeybees, but we tend to not to know a lot about these other native pollinators, and it's just simply because some of the science isn't there, right? As as to what will contribute to these other pollinators that we're now beginning to realize that we need to be interested in. And, you know, butterflies, like I just got that the Ohio, Ohio just put out a study uh, monitoring butterfly populations for the past 20 years, and they said they had a 40% decrease. And so are the, what University of Illinois, I mean, there's not a ton of research that has been done in the past. And now it's really important for your research to be done to conserve pollinators. And I know these are long-winded questions, but, you know, it was like, Alex, what flower, I mean, you're asking this question, what flower do I plant in my yard that's going to contribute to pollinator health? And I think that that's a big question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, big, get, yeah. Oh, we get asked it all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a really hard question to answer, too, because what works in some yards is not going to work in others, right? Like some things like I have parts of my yard that I have finally accepted are shade gardens and need to only have shade plants. I just have mm -hmm. to stop fighting this. Right. Um, and, you know, you can tell people to put like, oh, you need to be planting native, you know, native plants or na native prairie plants. And it's just like, yeah, but those are never going to do well in this section of my yard. Right. Or, mm -hmm. um, and then there are other things that people have to consider. Right. Like there are people who have um, uh, or, you know, where they live, there are ordinances that have to that require them to meet certain uh, neatness um uh aesthetics and I, I mean i i personally am opposed to those but i've definitely been fined by the city of uh, champagne about by because my some of my plants were too tall or like obstruct i live it on a corner and so you know the plants are too tall they're obstructing view they get too dense they you know or or what have you and um we need to find something we need to make things accessible for people right like it, and it, we're you know some people are like everyone needs to go all natives all the time and i'm like yeah but like if you say that, then you're telling, then other people are going to say, I'm never going to do that. So I'll just keep spraying my lawn mm -hmm. until it just keep a perfect blanket lawn. Right. And so if you can find other ways to let people in, you know, maybe they'll start with something small, like putting in some ornamental plants that are, uh, that are pollinator friendly. And then maybe they'll eventually work their way up to some natives that they, that they like. And maybe eventually, you know, maybe, you know, you, I think you have to meet people where they are. And mm -hmm. a lot of people are not at the like, all natives all the time uh, for various reasons, including mine, which is that like I tried that and then the city wrote me a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but just just a baby step in the right direction, though, is reducing some of that urban monoculture of turf grass. You know, if you just take a little section of your yard out of turf grass, that's a tiny step in the right direction. And I mean, that's really probably one of our biggest um, 
you know, bad areas or, or again, monoculture, the urban landscape is just all that mowed turf that really doesn't hardly provide anything, you know? Yeah. So. So Alex, you created a community science project called I Pollinate mm -hmm. in order to help people like Candace, Ryan, and I to educate people on pollinators. And so can you tell us a little bit about um, the project and what the questions you're trying to ask and, 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 you know, maybe how, you know, the people watching the show today can contribute to iPollinate. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to. So um, uh, several years ago, I, as I mentioned, I have prairie plants in my front yard. They are seven feet tall and the city writes me fines every year. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've never actually had to pay the fine. I usually write them a nice note back and say like, hey, I will cut it down. You're just going to have to wait. <laughs> um, I, I, love, I love that you're resisting. Yeah. <laughs> you are a plantsman. <laughs> um, but yeah, when I bought my house, I noticed I have a lot of um, ornamental plants that were already living there that pollinators seem to love perfectly fine, especially things like sedums, right? Like I'm sure if anybody has a sedum in their yard yeah. in the fall, it is covered with insects, butterflies of all varieties, you know, uh, flies, bees, all kinds of stuff. And I was like looking through and trying to find, well, okay, in areas that like, again, I live on a corner, there are visibility issues that I legitimate, uh, you know, I don't fight the city too hard. They have legitimate visibility issues <laughs> with some mm -hmm. of the plants I put in. <laughs> and um, uh, what I was like, well, what else? If I don't want turf grass out there, what could I be putting out there that's going to be short, um, is maybe going to, you know, kind of stay looking very neat because as much as I love native plants, they also seed themselves and uh, send out rhizomes and runners and, you know, can create really dense thickets. Um, so it's like, well, what else could I be putting out there that uh, maybe is going to, that I know it's growth form a little bit more consistently and I feel confident that it could do well and meet, and meet the city's requirements. And there just really weren't any good recommendations. There were, you know, everything is just like, if you want to say pollinators, you just have to put in natives. And I was like, well, most of the natives on this list are seven feet tall. Like I'm not putting Joe Pie weed in my front yard. Like, I'm sorry. I love Joe Pie weed. It's a beautiful plant. It's very, you know, but it is, it is, it's, you know, it's taller than me. It's to the sky almost. And yeah. I figured there had to be something that we could, again, meet people where they are. Like, if you think about the, where, are, where are, where is turf grass most predominant? It's in suburban neighborhoods. A lot of those suburban neighborhoods have HOAs that have requirements about what they have to look like, what their lawns have to look like you're never going to get them to be able to move to all natives. Like it's just not going to be, it's not it's just not possible. And so we have to find ways to break into those, ha those areas, those habitats um, to provide people with other solutions. And so we started, I, pollin I started, well, what was originally the CU pollinator count to start looking at um, how, what, what do bees like, do insects like any of these? Uh, kind of native annuals, uh, oh, not native, uh, like annual ornamentals that we can have people put into their yards. And, you know, you could give them a list and say like, hey, these ones are pretty good for pollinators. Um, and then, you know, uh, Extension asked us if we wanted to team up with several other pollinator programs, that are projects that were kind of happening at the University of Illinois, including a monarch-based project and um, a bumblebee project. And so we kind of package those all together as I pollinate with ultimately the whole goal is to try and figure out how to make Illinois uh, better, uh, better habitat for pollinators by doing more monitoring and understanding of where, what, what pollinators like, what habitats they like to live in, and then how they're responding to um, these kind of broader, broader questions about plants, diversity, and landscapes. Very cool. It's an awesome so, program. Yeah. So what do I have to do for I pollinate? Yeah, so um, yeah, visit our website, ipollinate.illinois.edu is the first thing. And there, you know, we kind of have a step-by-step -step of what's going on. This year, we introduced a training program. So we've been running iPollinate for a number of years. And a lot of people would write to us and just say, like, I just don't feel confident that I'm doing this right. I'm just like, you know, um, they want to do the, the, you know, we're very fortunate that the folks who've been participating in iPollinate are just so passionate about pollinator conservation. They're like, I just want to make sure I'm doing it right. And so this year we introduced some additional training 
So we asked folks to take a short training module. It's not too long um, to try and learn a little bit more about how to distinguish different types of pollinators. So your, bee, bird, your bees from your wasps, your bees from your flies. There's some flies that look a lot, a lot uh, like bees. Um, and how to distinguish the different instars of monarch larvae that might be coming to your plants. Um, and then we ask people to register uh, to put in a garden. Um, and then they, uh, when they register, then we send them a list of plants that they can choose from. Uh, they put in a, a small garden. It's a, I think we usually say about six by four um, with six different plants of, uh, of ornamental uh, annual plants and then uh, a, monarch, uh, a monarch species. And then you go out and it's really quick, the monitoring. You go out once a month um, during the third week of the month and you, you can sit comfortably in a little lawn chair and you watch, you watch your plants and see what comes. And then you are able to submit that data. And that actually is awesome because it tells us, it allows us to say back to the uh, horticultural team, hey, we're seeing a ton of, you know, bees and butterflies visiting these species, verbenas or other things. And um, that's, and then that ultimately we hope to be able to publish a statewide list of like, these are annual ornamental plants that bees are really, or insects are really excited about. Um, and if you, you know, maybe you can help, you know, if you, if you want to do something for pollinators, you know, move slightly away from your turf grasses, um, and help, you know, that can provide a little bit of options for folks. Awesome. And it's not too late to register for that, right? It's not, it's getting a little late. Um, it's getting a little late, I will admit, uh, because uh, the data collection doesn't start until the third week of, of June. Okay. But um, we do hope people will have their gardens in for at least a few weeks to kind of get established, start flowering a little bit more. And I don't know if you've been to the garden centers recently, but the plants are getting very picked over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think everyone saw this beautiful spring and we're like, you know, I went, I went recently and I was like, oh my goodness, like I, yeah. I had been there a few, I had been there a uh, Mother's Day weekend and it seemed packed. And when I went back uh, last weekend or two weekends ago, I was like, oh, hmm, okay, I, press, I, should, I probably should have bought those plants a, a few weeks ago. <laughs> but Alex, I have noticed that it was easier to find swamp milkweed, which is the milkweed that David wants us to, um, he wants us to plant for uh, four milkweeds in these pollinator gardens, and he wants to, us to uh, track monarchs, uh, caterpillars along the way. And when we first started this I Pollinate project, I had troubles finding swamp milkweed, but I've noticed that it's easier and easier to find. So maybe the word is getting out on swamp milkweed. But I just planted my I Pollinate garden yesterday. So... Um, we are going to do the um, the four observations for the ornamental plants, and that's um, uh, for the one part, the uh, ornamental uh, attractiveness. And then we'll also take um, monitor the milkweed, and then we're also going to take pictures um, of some of the bumblebees and upload them to Bee Spotter. So we really only have three things to do. We're looking at those pollinators on her plants. We're looking at the milkweed, and then we're uploading to Bee Spotter. So let me show you what we did yesterday, if I can share my screen. Yeah, please do. And that, while you're doing that, I think what's nice, too, is that you can also do these in um, containers, which is how I've uh, done it in the past. Mm -hmm. So please um, don't judge me on the weeds that are around here. Um, I was like, oh, 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 we have some poison hemlock, <laughs> but this is all being taken care of. So, you know, uh, I'm trying to keep the plants, you know, away. there's a, a, this is a community garden. There's raised beds. I'm trying to keep all the flowering plants away from this area. So this is just us preparing. So I put out the plants. This was the list. I did do a few more than four just because I wanted to um, uh, uh, you know, have the garden look beautiful. Um, so uh, I was really excited to have the purple salvias and the yellow lantanas. Now, the list that we were sent, she, had two, she has two separate lists. One was like the most popular ornamentals. And we know we see petunias and lantana everywhere. And 
Um, so we're excited. And then um, there was one where she has where there are more pollinator known pollinator friendly ones, but these are really the ones that, you know, are the top selling annuals that everybody uses. So um, I spaced it out. And then I did something that most gardeners freak out when I plant annuals. Um, one of the things that, and Candace knows because I have freaked out on um, her and her, uh, the students at, when they worked for me at the greenhouse, if they tore up those roots, I was on them. Don't be tearing up those roots. Why are you tearing up those roots? Well, one thing that people think is when they're planting is they'll sit there and they'll smush up this root ball and they'll, it'll go, they'll go crazy. No, don't do that. Uh, only tear up the roots if it's root bound. And you see some of these just needed a little slice. Some of them I actually, you know, cut the, uh, I just like shaved the entire outer portion of the root ball. I didn't squish anything up. I never squish roots. And then notice what is the other thing that I did, Candace? Removed all the flowers. I removed all the flowers. Now, everybody freaks out there. Oh, are you going to be ready? Are you going to be ready for eye pollinate observations? Yeah, my flowers might be a little bit slower, but I am going to, what, what it's going to focus on is it's focusing on root development and not sustaining those flowers. And because I'm letting it focus on root development for these first couple of weeks, I'm going to have more flowers in the long run. And the first observation, one of the things that I personally noticed about the first observation is it's a, it's a tiny bit slow. I mean, it's perfect. It's easy because the insects are just really starting to build up their population. It was July that I had the most fun. The observations in July are, I mean, there's, there's insects everywhere. And then in, in August and September, those are when it really got heated up. Um, so don't be discouraged if you don't see, a, have a lot. And I'm sure Alex can um, confirm this is don't be discouraged if you don't have a lot in that first observation, mm -hmm. because it's not really that heated up yet. Would you agree, Alex, that it's really July and August that you start really having the fun? Absolutely. So uh, even in our, even in our native prairie sampling, June is always a little like, you know, kind of things that we, I was just out in the prairie yesterday and we saw some big clean bumblebees, but not much else, right? It was pretty, pretty quiet out there. Um, it was also pretty overcast in the morning, but yeah, June is, you know, and we see this in all of our studies, really uh, bee uh, diversity and abundance really ramps up, right? Like in June, you start getting things coming out, that, but July, you see a lot more things, especially butterflies, right? Like, I mean, I don't think I've seen really any butterflies yet this year. So, you know, you start seeing a lot more come July, come August. And the monarchs are here. I've seen it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I've seen other people see them. <laughs> yeah, I saw one in my yard uh, Monday mm, on, nice. on, swamp, on uh, butterfly weed. So on a milkweed. That's kind of cool. There you go. So, I mean, I did this at an existing project. Um, I'm going to teach some kids to do the pollinator observations with me, um, just to, uh, you know, teach them a little bit more about pollinators. Um, so, you know, doing this project, Alex, this is the thing that I think took me for the biggest loop. Flies are really important pollinators. And I think gardeners don't get that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the more and more people who, the, um, I have a student in my lab who studies flies and when he first came to me and was like, I think I want to study flies. I was like, why? <laughs> 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 he, you know, he just, he just defended his PhD. And so now Dr. Clem has in the last five years convinced me that flies are actually super important pollinators. <laughs> and more and more evidence is uh, being found every, it seems like every day that flies are just really important pollinators. They, you know, we don't, we don't think of them as pollinators because they don't, they just seem to be moving so haphazardly or so carelessly. And, um, but oftentimes when you look, when, um, when you're observing flowers, 
the things that you see most often are actually flies, not bees, right? And so that means that they're doing something out there and they're probably contributing to pollination of these species quite a lot. Um, they also visit things that other like bees have very little interest in. They tend to visit a lot of uh, things in the carrot family and the ABAC. You see them, they love carrot flowers. They can be the predominant pollinators of certain um, certain families and certain groups. And so they're actually super important pollinators. Um, and they come in just like a really wide uh, array of um, sizes and colors and shapes. And um, they just, especially I think at, at, at times of the year where bee diversity is really low, like in the spring, flies, you know, flies dominate. You see lots of flies out in the early spring. We see very few bees. In the fall, we also see tons of flies, very few uh, bees. Um, they're some of the first things that come out. They're super important. Very cool. Awesome. Well, we are also a question and answer um, show to Alex, and we've had some questions that are that fit right into this. So if anybody watching has questions, feel free to add those to the comment box. But this one kind of applies to what we we're just talking about. Laurel asks, um, I've recently read that electronic mosquito zappers kill a lot more beneficial insects than they do mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. I have large ones both by my pool uh, and next to the house in a perennial bed. They do seem to help keep down the mosquitoes, especially at the pool, but should I get rid of them? Um, what do we say to that? Yeah, uh, probably. Um, I, um, yeah, it's tough. I'm sorry. I, I know people are really trying to keep the mosquitoes down. The way I keep the mosquitoes down is just when I'm outside, I turn a fan on. I have like a little outdoor fan because they're just, mosquitoes are the worst flyers. They are terrible. Yeah. They are terrible flyers, right? <laughs> and so they actually can't, uh, a, a small breeze will keep them off of you. And so I usually just sit under a fan. And I know that's not really appealing to many people, but those bug zappers, a lot of things that are designed to control mosquitoes actually have devastating effects on insect populations. Um, any kind of like mosquito spray treatments that people are doing, these, these zappers that you're talking about, they're just, they're, you know, when we're in a, a crisis where we know that the in, insect diversity is just really tanking, not just pollinators, but all insects, which are super important for, bee, for they think that this is one of the major contributors to bird decline. So if, even if you don't really care much for insects, you care about birds um, and other things that eat insects, bats, and all kinds of, you know, other things, um, small mammals what have you, um, by trying to control the mosquitoes, we're oftentimes killing way more beneficial insects than we are actually doing things to get rid of the, uh, rid of the mosquitoes. And um, I have a colleague that studies uh, mosquitoes and um, they said that, you know, the best thing you can do is just make sure you don't have open containers of water, make sure your gutters are cleaned out um, and, and flowing properly. Um, I don't think that the mosquitoes really, they shouldn't be able to, um, uh, replicate in your pool. So your pool is probably not really a source of mosquitoes. There may be something else in your yard mm -hmm. that you are unaware of. In particular, one thing more effective at getting rid of the mosquitoes and also not going to be doing these really detrimental things to um, to the other insects that are we're trying to hopefully support. Um. Find up there. <laughs> like, you know, I've found trees growing in my gutter. There's that much water and soil and material. So, yeah, um, yeah I love your recommendation of a fan outside. Mm -hmm. Like that just sounds so refreshing to have a fan blowing up right. your gardening. Um, you know, for me, I've I've tried to avoid mosquitoes. I have a really mosquito-y backyard because we're along the Sangamon River, you know, and we've got a big floodplain there. So there's a lot of mosquitoes. Um, I love to be up in the early morning, um, and that's just not a good time to be in my garden because there is a massive amount of mosquitoes out. So um, I tend to, if I'm trying to avoid mosquitoes, I tend to do my gardening activities in the heat of the day, mm -hmm. you know, in the full sun. And so your fan idea sounds like a wonderful, refreshing addition mm -hmm. to that. But I've been pretty successful at avoiding them that way. I mean, another thing that I've done is I mean, believe it or not, I've got a, a head net that I wear at times when I've got to be out there and it just at least keeps them out of my face and off of me. And um, I'm definitely, you know, bug spray is something that I really don't use that much. And so just with the combination of if I'm outside and it's cool and I put on a head net or I wear like very light, long sleeve, you know, long pants. Um, I think there's a lot of ways you can just really kind of not be there when they're, they want to be there and mm -hmm. avoid a lot of the, you know, the exposure to mosquitoes. So, and one other place where they often um, that people don't think about is downspouts. So you think like, oh, those don't get clogged, but 
a lot of downspouts, unless like unless they're really steep, they do actually hold a small amount of water, especially if you put the downspout extenders on with the the ones that are like um, kind of ring shaped, like they have, yeah. they have those Corrugated. all those little yeah. rings yeah. have little places where the, where they collect water, and so that's actually a, a huge source of mosquitoes that people are often not thinking about at all because they're like, oh, the water's you know the gutters are clean, the water is moving away from the house and the foundation of the house, but like those downspouts create like perfect mosquito habitat. <laughs> I think it, I think another big offender is just things my kids leave around the yard that I don't pick up right away and like I'll go pick it up and there's a little pool of water with larva in it there. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah. Great. <laughs> so I've been looking into the bug zapper thing when it comes to moths. You know, moths aren't, you know, your most prevalent pollinators, but they pollinate things that um, like Alex said, that bees may not pollinate or other pollinators. And so those bug zappers are really getting some of our moths. Mm-hmm. And also back to Alex again, I mean, could you, I was shaking my head. I was like habitat, when it comes to mosquitoes, you're probably breeding them where you're living. So you need to work on that rather than trying to spray for the adults because you actually are, you know, doing yourself a little bit of a disservice. When we think about those moths and the caterpillars of those moths. She talked about birds. Where are the caterpillars going to, where are the birds going to get food if we don't have moths? So it's all this, I'm against the bug zappers. I don't like them. Yeah, I, I, think, I think they I think zap the wrong way, things. Yeah. I think a good way to test it is just to look at what's underneath your bug zapper. Is it a yeah. big pile of mosquitoes or is it a big pile of all kinds of different bugs? And, and you know, you're probably going to see a big diversity, and you're you're knocking out that out of your yard. Everything, everything laying there. So. And the lace wings are out at night too, and those are a really good beneficial insect that are going to be great for your garden. So, okay, awesome, good tips. Uh, let's see, we had a couple other questions here. Um, Sheila asked earlier; she has two two part question. What is the all time best plant to attract honeybees? If you had to pick one, what would be your top honeybee attractor? <laughs> I know that's like an impossible yeah. question. <laughs> um, honeybee attracting plants. Honeybees are, I mean, no or maybe just bees in general. If you want to okay. go more general, I was going to say not, not, no offense to people who love honeybees. They, you know, <laughs> yeah, they're not, they're, um, they will visit just about anything. Um, Anything that produces a lot of uh, nectar they like. And so oftentimes in places where they're trying to, um, thinking specifically about honeybees, if they're trying to uh, cultivate um, or strengthen bee colonies, they often put them in places with like a lot of like red clover. Now, red clover is super weedy. Uh, You probably don't want that at your house. Um, (laughs) So I'm trying to think of an an alternative of something that... um, um, that they might that they might like or visit. Um, Minnesota promotes the white clover as that bee lawn program. Okay, I, I think that is a really hard question. I mean, it is. Yeah, I know it is. Um, um, but 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 I would say that clovers are actually really challenging. So they're not great for general pollinators or even most bees because you know the Fabaceae flowers have that special peel. They're very long tubes, like. So if it's for honeybees specifically, I would say red clovers would probably be good if you want to put in a like very weedy Mm -hmm. invasive plant. (laughs) Um, But anything, honestly, uh, uh, honeybees are not really that picky. They they mostly go for volume. So like anything that you can plant in very large quantities, (laughs) they will, you know, they will enjoy. So if it's, whether it's a coreopsis, which I'm always telling people, if you want a native plant that you can put in your yard that bees will love, Coreopsis is like the one to go for. It doesn't, you can put Coreopsis lanceolata. It doesn't get super tall. It's only like maybe 18 inches off the ground. It flowers. Mm-hmm. Mine's already flowering and it's going to keep flowering like all summer long. It has these beautiful yellow disc flowers that um, all kinds of things can visit. Honeybees and all kinds of bees will really like it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can plant them at, you know, at high densities and like have a nice, yellow carpet that people, that bees will be really super excited about. Alex, do you know what I always say where gardeners will give me dirty looks? Wow. Chives. Oh, yeah. I just could chives. not ever. I 
I mean, every single time I see a chive flower, mm-hmm. it's like there's an insect on it. Mm-hmm. 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 And so gardeners are like, oh, I don't want that plant. It's aggressive. And I'm like, well, it attracts the pollinators. <laughs> Are chives yeah. aggressive? I definitely killed one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the garlic. The garlic more aggressive yeah. than just the purple. Yes, yeah. But oh, okay. it's still... You know, sometimes not the neatest plant, but personally, I think it should be used as a ground cover. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm I will still say, working on that. This was in my in my effort where I was trying to force things to live in my shade area that don't like shade. So <laughs> the chives felt they fell victim yeah. to my like force forcing sun plants to live in a shade garden, and so they got it just died shade out. Shade would be tough, yeah. yeah. But but I do have my favorite pollinator plant, uh-huh. which. Um, um, definitely not on the same level as Alex, but you know, that's like saying, which like Candace, what's your favorite plant? She's like, what kind of plant? I mean, right now it's peony, but next month it'll be something else. Yes, it's, <laughs> I feel the same way. What looks beautiful. I love black and blue salvia. Mm-hmm. And um, so uh, I know that she has purple salvia in um, one of her iPod, the, the iPod, we planted purple salvia. And um, black and blue salvia, my goodness, it just buzzes with bees and moths and flies and hummingbirds. I mean, I just, every time I plant it, it is always like a successful plant when it comes to pollinators. Yeah, salvia, they love salvias. I have several, and I love putting them in my yard. I have several different varieties. I don't know that I have any of the black and blue because I usually, that's an annual, right? And I usually mm-hmm. put the perennial, I usually put the perennial varieties in and yeah, like you said, cover top to bottom, but even my rose bush this year was covered with things. Like, I, and I think, you yeah. know, they love flowers. They don't really, <laughs> just making yeah. sure you have enough flowers is, is, a, is a, a good step in the right direction. Yeah. Okay. So she asked the same thing best plant for butterflies. So switching gears to butterflies now, what would you say differently for that? Hmm. Not butterfly bush. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Uh, Everyone thinks like that, that should like butterflies. I mean, they visit it fine, but like, it's not, it doesn't, they can't, um, one of the big things for butterflies is that they need habitat for a leg for caterpillars and butterfly bush. I've never seen a single, not one single caterpillar on it, right? Like it's not a good caterpillar plant um, for them. Um, what would be a good, uh, verbenas and lantanas, they do really like those if you're looking for something that's annual. Um, uh, salvias, they actually visit a lot of salvias. They, they both tend to get a lot of visits as well. Um, trying to think. Did you say like the open flowers, like Mexican sunflower that and yeah. zinnias would be really yeah, zinnias. I, I see a lot on those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Zinnias in particular. Yeah. Those are usually mm-hmm. really good yeah. too. I remember coming up to a, 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 a planting of Mexican sunflowers and they're huge. And there were, it was like this whole hedge of them. And there were thousands of monarchs on this hedge of uh, Mexican sunflower. It was incredible to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorites is butterfly weed for sure. Oh, yeah. For monarchs, of course, in particular, but that's one of my favorites. And that's a milkweed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Nice long bloom time. I think yeah. That's one of the Beautiful I like orange flowers. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I really like swamp milkweed too. I'm mm-hmm. glad to see you guys include that in your mix. And I mean, I just think it's a really pretty flower display for milkweed and it's fragrant. If you've mm-hmm. never smelled it, it's got a nice cinnamony smell and nice sized plant. So, yeah. Yeah. David used that one because he thinks it's the, uh, because it's the more preferred one, right, Alex? It is. Yeah. So several years ago, someone did like a preference, like a, 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 a monarch preference choice analysis to see like of all the monarch, of all the uh, milkweeds, which one do they seem to preferentially lay eggs on and which ones do the monarchs also seem to develop better on. And uh, swamp milkweed was by far the best, uh, but, you know, by a long, like a long shot. And some, they actually develop pretty poorly on some things. Like actually butterfly milkweed, they don't develop super great on it. I think partly it's that the plant, you know, butterfly milkweed leaves are really hairy. So they're covered with trichomes, which means that the, the larvae are eating all these trichomes too, which is just like another thing for them to have to deal with. And mm-hmm. compared to something like swamp or common milkweed, where you just have these like super smooth uh, yeah. uh, leaves and so they and smaller too 
Yeah, yeah they just seem to do material. a lot better on those. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so the swamp milkweed is, a, you know, by far the more preferred uh, species for them to lay eggs on. But, uh, you know, as you guys have mentioned, butterflies, not just milkweed, not just monarchs, but all kinds of butterflies love milkweed flowers. They look, they, they make a ton. You can see the droplets of nectar inside of a milkweed flower, right? And so um, that's what they're coming for. And they're, you know, they're happy to like lap it up. Awesome. So I've, I've certainly observed more on swamp milkweed, more monarch caterpillars on mm-hmm. swamp milkweed, but I do see them on butterfly weed. And I, mm-hmm. you know, we're, my wife and I are always sitting around kind of thinking about like, why did all those caterpillars on that butterfly milkweed just disappear? And I, I have to wonder if um, on a large swamp milkweed plant, those caterpillars can kind of hide from predators and just blend in a little better where maybe that's a negative side to butterfly milkweed, which we probably have more of it planted at my house. But it's a smaller plant. I feel like it'd be easier for a bird to swoop in. Do you, you think there's any any truth to that theory, or any have you observed that? Yeah. I, well, I've I, so you know we do our our observations in the third week of June for I pollinate, uh, or the third week of the month. I've definitely um, I went out the, like the day before and I said, "Oh wow, my swamp milkweed is covered with caterpillars! Like this is going to be so exciting." And I went out the next day to do my observations and they had all vanished. I don't know where they went. And like, I, you know, we ask people to put their gardens a meter away from other plants, just, um, you know, for scientific reasons, we try and make sure that you're some things, you, everyone's having some similar effects of their garden. And so if we let people put them wherever they would, where they wanted to, some would put them, you know, nestled in their native garden, some would put them Mm-hmm. in different places. So anyway, we try and keep have them isolated a little bit. Uh, so yeah, so where the, once they leave that patch, they've got to crawl at least a meter to any other plants in my yard. And I actually don't have any milkweeds close to this, my eye pollinate plant. So I don't know where they go. I, you know, I have observed that, but um, never on the butterfly milkweed, but I'm not sure, you know, uh, one of the reasons they feed on milkweeds is because they, they can, uh, they, they accumulate the, um, the toxins of milkweeds into their tissue. So they shouldn't be being preyed on that much. Uh, that, 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 so that shouldn't be a major part of it. So I'm not, I don't know, maybe they just get hot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I see, I see them succumb to disease and parasitic flies or wasps. I'm sure there's something out there. Mm-hmm. I see them succumb to that, but I had the same similar thing last year, Alex, where I was like, two or three days before observation, I was like, wow, look at this. This is going to take me forever. And then I went back and I was a little disappointed. But I mean, I think it's still good information to um, record. But uh, I mean, I think another thing is I think people don't realize that, you know, monarch caterpillars, you know, and eggs, they don't, you know, it's not 100% guarantee. There's like, what, a 10% guarantee that a monarch egg is going to be laid and make it to adulthood? Yeah. And I tend to find the chrysalis on the side of my garage. Last year, there was one on the garage door. <laughs> so it's like, I rarely see them near where my butterfly weed, they go off somewhere else and make that chrysalis, I've, which is interesting too. I've seen them cross roads. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I'm like, really, <laughs> you're going to cross a road? Yeah. Alex, can you ask the monarchs that question? Why would they cross a road? Yeah, like you guys said, like sometimes you see where the chrysalis is and you're like, why would, how did that become the place? Yeah, why? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, we've had some great follow up questions come in as we've been talking. Um, Angie asked, is it true that monarchs only lay eggs on milkweed? Yes, that is indeed uh, true, Angie. So if you want to help out those uh, monarchs, you can plant any species of milkweed. It'll be helpful. Some better than others, like we've been talking about. Um, Let's see. Laurel asks, is Mexican sunflower tithonia? Yep, it sure is. That's the the species is tithonia. Uh, And Amy asks, just wondering, are hummingbirds considered pollinators? What would you say to that? Absolutely. I think that hummingbirds are considered pollinators. Um, they are, you know, because most most insects that feed on nectar are, are pretty good pollinators, including, sorry, mosquitoes can actually be <laughs> pollinators. Yep. And, you know, when they're not when they're not feeding on you, mm-hmm. when they're <laughs> they're often visiting flowers, you will see them quite often visiting flowers. And um, if we think of pollination as like an accident. Right. That's really what it is. It's like 
somebody came for a meal and then I stuck some gametes to its face and then it flew away and it went somewhere else. <laughs> and um, and you hope that it deposited there. And so, but the, the chance that that's going to happen is low. Um, and so you, you know, it's just an accident. That's really kind of like, you know, and sometimes some, some accidents are more efficient than others, right? Like some bees are, can be really hairy. And so they're typically considered really good pollinators because they just, they get more things stuck to them because they just have a lot of hair. Um, but you know, flies have a little bit of hair and, um, birds like hummingbirds, which is what we're talking about. You know, they have covered with feathers. They, they stick their faces down into flowers. Um, the number of flowers that they can pollinate are, are sort of a bit smaller, uh, but they are, they can be really, I mean, and some plants are like hummingbird specialists, right? Like they, if they don't have a hummingbird visit them, they will not make seeds. So mm-hmm. um, they are, they definitely are pollinators. Cool. Yeah. I just saw one on my feet, on my feeder yesterday. I was excited to see one. Mm-hmm. Um, so, okay. Uh, can I ask a really quick question? We're seeing a lot of stuff in extension, like, you know, the carpenter bees are, I don't know what is going on with those this year. It seems like they are like very healthy. Yeah. Um, and then what, as the summer comes, we'll start to see all these large kind of scary looking wasps. And, you know, us and extension are always trying to say, no, those are pollinators. Those are <laughs> pollinators. How do you sell wasps as a pollinator when there's that fear factor? What do you yeah. say about wasps? Um. You know, with most things, bees, other stinging insects, if you don't bother them, they will mostly not bother you. Wasps can be a lot more aggressive than bees tend to be. Um, And I just tell people that like everything has a place in the environment. Wasps are really important for controlling other pest insects that you don't love, right? Uh, They can, you know, they kill, they have cicada killers. I know some people are are annoyed about how much noise the cicadas make. Um, They control other populations of pests. They... Um, a lot of wasps are so small, you would never even notice or see them. Um, and there are lots of good things, like natural things that you, you can do, I think, that kind of help, that seem to help repel wasps, right? Like they, uh, just making sure your food is covered when you're not eating, right, is, is a big part because that's what they get attracted to. Uh, but they are they are actually important pollinators. I have a plant that um, I hate, it's, I've been trying to get rid of, uh, gooseneck. Mm. Um, Goose stripe. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's supposed to be sterile, by the way. Maybe that'll be regraded well, in that new front yard. <laughs> <laughs> I inadvertently spread it to another section of my yard too, and I was oh, like, no. "Why?" Um, but that wasps love. That's the only thing I ever see visit that plant is is, is wasps, and maybe mm-hmm. they are sterile, but they they seem to the wasps really seem to love them, and so. Um, I, I don't I, think they are. I think that's how they were touted. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. They, they spread by rhizomes pretty like aggressive, okay. like very Maybe. aggressively. So they don't yeah. really seem to, I've never seen them make seeds, but they okay. seem, they get, they send out a thousand runners in all directions. And, um, but yeah, so we, uh, so I, you know, I, I love wasps. I think that they, you know, everything has an important place in the environment and they, you know, they reduce all populations of all kinds of things, grasshoppers and, cicadas and other things that we don't really love as much and so um like i said if i if you if you ignore them they most often will ignore you um occasionally you know you get little paper wasp nests in places that are very inconvenient um you know knock those down to protect the family and the kids but otherwise um you know they'll mostly leave you alone nice so amy asks why are there so many carpenter bees is there a reason just um, you know, they're more common in urban habitats because we have the perfect dry wood necessary to support their populations. I had a, a new front porch put on, or new stairs to my front porch anyway, put on a few years ago. That, that thing wasn't up three days before I saw a carpenter bee try to gnaw on. And I was like, <laughs> we didn't even get to stain it yet. Like, give me a, give me a <laughs> Um, Yeah, they uh, they can be really aggressive. And it's just because we, pre- we create perfect habitats for them, right? Like with all of our wood, um, they just, they really seem to thrive, uh, just dry, dry wood, right? That's what they need to be able to make their nests and nothing like an urban environment to like support like significant amounts of dry, yeah. really dry wood for them. Um, and they can be, uh, really devastating, right? They destroy people's entire porches and, um, patios and things like that. So, uh, those, uh, you know, in your face. 
Yeah, they do. Yeah, they're a little more aggressive, it seems. Yeah. Well, they're mostly they're scary dumb. though. I haven't gotten I've never very few people get stung by them. They mostly they mostly right. use a fear tactic of like, I am giant, you will be afraid of me. But yes. <laughs> I've noticed that too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, oh. we've got a couple of final good questions here. Um Darla says she's surrounded by trees. Would a pollinator garden work here? So you were kind of talking earlier about your shade garden. Are there any good shade pollinator plants that you can think of? Yeah, there are. Um, let's see. Uh, especially in the springtime, there are lots of things that, you know, are the pollinators will visit. Uh, lots of great spring um, annuals and uh, well, spring uh, perennials, too. Um, if you want to put some spring beauty in, these mm-hmm. love it. Uh, that grows really well. And um, it's a native plant, Clectonia. It grows really well in, in um, really shady habitats. Um, even things like geraniums, because they're spring spring flowering, will do pretty well in a, in a shady area. Mm-hmm. Um, I just bought um, a shade-tolerant, um, what is it? Um, a goldenrod, actually, that, uh, mm-hmm. that Soledago, uh, Omophoria or something like that, that um, it's short. Again, mm-hmm. tea for my yard, uh, and um, is shade tolerant. And there, are, I think there are lots of things that people can find to put in shade, shady areas. I mean, we've all seen tons of bees on hostas, right? I was so going to say that, yeah, yeah. If you hummingbirds, if, yeah. yeah, hummingbirds. Mm-hmm. If you want to put some hostas in your yard, uh, may apples. Um, uh, what else uh, does? And, well and we shade? horticulturists like to tell you that sedum takes full sun. But we horticulturists know that you can throw sedum pretty much anywhere <laughs> and it will grow and flower. I have seen yeah. sedum flowering in full shade and have bees on it. And I'm just like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, we, we could, we don't even have to tell you, you have to have full sun for sedum. Wouldn't you, I mean, Magical. Alex, well, Alex, have you, do you have sedum in your shade garden? I don't actually have, I, 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 I don't have any sedums in my shade garden, but that's a great idea because I, one, I love sedums, right? They come in all heights and varieties, variegated, mm-hmm. not variegated. Insects love them. They flower beautifully. Mm-hmm. Um, that, you know, you can get them. Uh, I like that they can be great ground covers, right? For places that get kind of weedy. Mm-hmm. Um, I, um, there was a short purple, uh, uh, vi- um, creeping vine that I uh, with dark purple leaves and it's really short. A juga, it's really, a juga, yeah. So that actually the um, uh, the bee insects seem to really like that. Uh, that you make some beautiful flowers, does really well in shady areas. Um, what else did I put in my shade? I, I recently added like an astrolabe, astro. I bought them on clearance. I'm not sure what they were, <laughs> but they came back, but they have really beautiful plants flowers. <laughs> Gotta love the clearance plants. <laughs> I go straight. I, I bring go, that plant back. I know. <laughs> I go straight to the back and I'm like, oh, you got 12 of these. Perfect. I can save this. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. If, if 60, if, you know, if 60 or 70% of them make it, then that's, that's, you know, I consider that a win. At, 50, it, right? at 50 or 60% all. <laughs> Nice. Okay, well, we'll finish with one final question here. Um, Reva asks, I see the caterpillars on my on my herbs, and she says dill, parsley, lovage, but none of these are near my milkweed plants. How far will they travel and how to get to the food? Then how do they travel and get to their cocoon place? Um, so the caterpillars you might be seeing are probably, especially if they're on something they they might not actually be yeah. a monarch caterpillar, so they probably don't need to need to move to the milkweed necessarily. Um, but they just crawl, right? They just kind of they they have legs, they crawl, and they you know move to the wherever they need to go to make their cocoons. But I often see I get a lot. I have a lot of um, of um, it, things in the ABAC in my in my in my yard, and that's I get so many swallowtails. They, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, that's what that's their um, their host plant for those those caterpillars, and so those the, that plant is usually blanketed mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, with cat with those caterpillars, and they will. Um, so if you're seeing something on parsley or different things like that, they're probably not um, monarch caterpillars, mm-hmm. but there are other caterpillars that you know specialize on on uh, some of these other plants that you're talking about. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we got through all the questions and we're about at at end time. So Alex, is there any kind of final 
thoughts you want to leave people with in terms of pollinators and eye pollinate? Yeah. Um, well, one, if you guys, if you are participating in eye pollinate, thank you so much. We have seen eye pollinate grow, grow, grow over the last three years. And like, we could not collect this incredibly valuable data without you. And I'm just so thankful that you want to participate. Um, and for those of you that haven't participated and you want to learn more about eye pollinate, please visit our website, ipollinate.illinois.edu, where you can find all kinds of fun things out about, um, about the program. You can get involved. It's not, it's, it's, it's not too late. Um, we would need you to kind of move a little bit quickly because we're trying to finalize um, our list and get, you know, make sure people get their gardens in before, we start collecting data during uh, National Pollinator Week, the third week of July, of June. Um, and um, overall, I pollinate is really simple. You know, the observations that we ask folks to make just really don't take very long. And they really are making a difference in Illinois to help us identify uh, where pollinators are, what kinds of things they like, and make our, make our state more pollinator friendly. Awesome. And, and I want to particularly to thank our Master Gardener volunteers. They've they've really jumped in on this project too and are doing a lot. So really appreciate that from, from them too. So thanks so much for joining us, Alex. This was super great. Lots of good questions, lots of good content. So hopefully everybody's feeling inspired to get out there and either put in an eye pollinate garden or just start small and start adding some of these great pollinator plants to their to their garden. So um, our next show will be in two weeks on June 17th. We're going to be back with uh, another uh, educator, Brittany Haig, is going to talk all about gardening activities for kids. So perfect timing for um, summer. And don't forget about our Facebook group, our Extension Horticulture Facebook group. You can ask questions and post pictures uh, there too in the meantime. But we want to thank everybody for joining us and thanks Alex in particular. And we will see you guys next time. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Thank